Hi, Verity. Hi, it's Henry. Can you hear me? Hi, Henry. Hi, Julia. How are you? I'm good. I'm just going to put you, are, are, can you see the slides okay? I can, um, and I'll mute until you're ready to start. Perfect. Or ready for me to talk. How's that? Sounds good. All right.
Hi everyone, this is Julia from the RNAO. We will begin at 2.30, so two more minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm from the RNAO. Thank you for joining the webinar with today. We hope that you can hear us clearly and see our slides. There is a chat box available where you can ask questions throughout the webinar, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Please ensure that if you are writing a question in the chat box, you use the all participants option. So I would like to welcome you to today's webinar as the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario officially introduces you to our newest best practice guideline, Preventing Violence, Harassment and Bullying Against Health Workers, the second edition. And this was published online in July. The guideline is a revision and replaces two previous guidelines, the 2008 Workplace Health Safety and Wellbeing of the Nurse and the 2009 Preventing and Managing Violence in the Workplace. So today's webinar will be presented by myself, and I'm the Senior Manager of Guideline Development and Research, as well as the Guideline Lead for this BPG. Also from the RNAO, I have Althea with me today, who is the Program Manager for the Healthy Work Environment Portfolio. And we're also fortunate to have with us today one of our expert panel co-chairs who helped lead this guideline, Henrietta Van Poole. Henrietta is the Vice President of Client Outreach at the Public Services Health and Safety Association, and you'll be hearing from her in a little bit. I would also like to thank the greater RNAO team that was involved with bringing this BPG to life. And of course, to thank and acknowledge the tremendous expertise and guidance of our expert panel in the development of this guideline. These individuals consisted of a variety of experts, including persons with lived experience, nurses in various roles, directors and managers, and were from a variety of healthcare sectors, including home care, acute care, and long-term care. 
The panel was committed to this project over the span of two years and provided critical oversight and support. Here I have an image of our panel that was taken at our launch back in April 2017. And again, I'd like to thank them for their engagement and contributions. 44 stakeholders also reviewed the guideline prior to its publication, and I would like to acknowledge them on the next two slides. Their names can also be found in the guideline on pages 26 through 28. So the objectives for today's webinar are one, to describe the components of the guideline development process, including the systematic reviews, to highlight all guideline recommendations, and to provide an overview of RNAO resources to support the implementation and evaluation of the Preventing Violence, Harassment, and Bullying Against Health Workers, BPG. So as most of you already know, the RNAO is the Professional Association of the Registered Nurse uh, of registered nurses, nurse practitioners, and nursing students in Ontario, Canada. Since 1925, RNAO has advocated for healthy public policy, promoted excellence in nursing practice, increased nurses' contribution to shaping the healthcare system, and influenced decisions that affect nurses and the public they serve. At RNAO, our values define health as a resource for everyday living, and that healthcare is a universal human right. We respect human dignity and are committed to diversity, inclusivity, equity, so social justice, and democracy. We believe the leadership of every nurse advances individual and collective health. The Best Practice Guidelines Program is a signature program of RNAO. One portfolio within the Best Practice Guideline Program is the Healthy Work Environment Portfolio, for which the Preventing Violence, Harassment, and Bullying Against Health Worker BPG is a part of. I'm going to now hand it over to Althea to provide a brief overview of the HWE portfolio and organizing framework. Thank you, Julia. So as you can see, the Healthy Work Environment uh, framework is quite complex. It, it is defined as a practice setting that maximizes the health and well-being of the healthcare providers, which includes the nursing professionals and other direct caregivers. Also, quality, patient outcomes, and organizational performance. The conceptual model of the healthy work environment presents a healthy workplace as a product of the interdependence between individual, organizational, and system determinants within the ecosystem. The ecological or the transactional view really suggests that the individual's functioning is mediated by the interactions between the individual and his or her environment. Thus, the interventions to promote healthy work environment must be aimed at multiple levels and components of the ecosystem. And it's important to realize, however, that the model suggests managing the interactions of the ecosystem as well as managing the ecosystem itself. So looking at the model, the assumptions underlying the model are as follows. The individual, organizational, and system level factors are the determinants of healthy work environments for nurses and other care providers. The factors at all three levels impact healthy work environments either individually or through synergistic interactions. The interactions between and among the three levels impact the health and well-being of the nurse, patient outcomes, and organizational performance. The professional occupational factors are unique to each profession, while the remaining factors are generic to all professions' occupations. So what you see on the slide right now is in the center, we have uh, the nurse, the patient, client, the organization society, indicating that what we do within the, within the healthy work environment work is to provide positive outcomes for that group. Now you'll also know that there are three circles and each of those represent uh, the individuals, it represents the organization and the environment in itself, the external environment. You'll also notice if you can see possibly that on the inner circle, we will have some lines and those are specific lines re referencing the individual. And then on the second circle, we have some dots which will reference what happens for the organization. And then on the outer line, it's all, or the outer circle, it is all solid representing the, the external work. You'll also see that the wedges are there. So the teal or the blue wedge looks at the components from the physical structural policy components that will affect all three of those components being the individual, the organization, and the external world. Also, the pink or the red uh, wedge will look at the professional, what 
from the professional occupational components impacts this work. And then the orange looks at the cognitive and the psychosocial and the cultural impact of that work. So I'll break it down um, a bit further for you on the individual. And so what we see, the schematic really depicts a relationship between the determinants within the ecosystem. And for the individual level, it's categorized, the three categories of determinants are identified as the physical characteristics, the demands of the work that actually impacts a healthy work environment. So this includes the requirements of the work that are necessary, uh, the physical capabilities, the efforts, and depending on the area that the, the nurse or the employee is in, it will certainly vary. So this aspect looks at the amount of lifting, the physical effort that is required to do the job. So as reflected in the model, these factors are related to the physical context of the organization and the external policy context. For the purpose of this topic of violence, the physical characteristics and demands of the work do impact nurses who may have to be dealing with physically large patients or moving uh, certain types of equipment uh, within their area that might in one point in time be used against them. And this is why that one is uh, so very, very important to pay attention to for this specific topic. The psychosocial characteristics of the work, that includes the requirements which necess necessitates the psychosocial capabilities and effort. So the coping skills, the communication skills, two skills, again, very, very important to coping with violence as well as many other things that happen uh, in the workplace. But how do we cope with violence when it comes to us? And how do we communicate to ensure that um, the information that we're sharing uh, with our patients and with our public population is done in an effective manner? So it's very important that the individuals who are using or in these roles are very, very skilled in using positive coping and ad adequate communication skills. So as reflected in the models, these factors are related to the social context of the organization as well as the external and social cultural context. The characteristics of the nurse, and again, that involves the personal attributes of that individual or their acquired skills and knowledge. What do they bring to the workplace? What experience do they have with dealing with violent patients or dealing with any population uh, within their organization? So it, it impacts and determines how the person responds to the physical and the psychosocial demands of the work as reflected in the model. These factors are related to our professional and the occupational context of the organization, as well as the external professional occupational context. Looking at the organizational level, the organizational level now, if you think back to the large uh, model that I showed at the first, that is a second circle with the, with the dots. And we have three categories of determinants that are there that are identified as well. The physical structure in the teal and the resource factors present uh, what's available in the workplace. So this includes the human and material resources and supports and structures that are present in the work environment as reflected in the model. These are related to the physical characteristics, demand of the job and the external policy context. Specific to this topic, we have to look at the physical layout of the organization to identify uh, safety and possible threats uh, for the nurses, and also resources such as panic buttons, uh, ease of communication, ease of access to other individuals to support in the event of a violent outbreak. Uh, the social factors are uh, presented in the workplace. Now, these factors are related to the organizational climate, the culture, and the value. As reflected in the model, these are also related to the psychosocial characteristics and demand of the job, as well as the system sociocultural factors. So the social factors, depending upon the organization uh, that you work in, will be different again, and also depending upon the culture and the values of yourself, as well as the culture of the values of the patient population that may be served. The third uh, is the professional occupational factors in the work environment. And these factors include characteristics of the nature and the role of the professional occupation. So the level of autonomy that one would have as a registered nurse or level of autonomy that one would have as a PSW physician, wherever you lie in the employment um, um, field, it really also the level of autonomy by that organization makes a huge difference and your scope of, of practice. So as reflected in the model, these are related to nurse characteristics as well as the jurisdictional 
national and international professional, and your occupational factors. So at the system or the external policy level, now that's the outer circle that you would have seen on the first slide uh, with the solid colors. And these categories are determined by the following, the external policy context. And these factors include legislative trade, economic and political frameworks, so such as migration policies and most, most recently within like the last five years, the, the legislation around violence that may be external to the organization, but certainly do reflect an impact. So as reflected in the model, these are related to the physical characteristics and demands of the job, as well as the structure and the resource factors that are present in the work environment. The external sociocultural fact context, now these factors include consumer trends, what the consumer really expects when they come into the organization, the changing care preferences, um, that people have depending upon their culture and certainly the changing roles of the family. Families are so much more involved and have so much more access now to organizations than previously. The diversity of the patient population and the providers and certainly the changing demographics and the health system reform, all of which influence how organizations and individuals operate. So as reflected in the model, these are also related to the psychosocial characteristics and demands of the job as well as the social factors that are present in the work environment. And the last one is the external professional occupational context. Now these factors include policies and regulations at the provincial, territorial, national and international levels, which influence how organizations and individuals operate, such as the standards of practice, uh, certification, uh, ethical recruitment. So as reflected in the model, these are related to nurse characteristics, as well as professional occupational factors in the environment. So I'll turn back over now uh, to Julia to uh, continue uh, with the rest of the, or to Henry, yeah, for mm -hmm. the, um, oh, sorry, Julia, <laughs> to continue with the presentation. Great, thanks, Sophia. Um, I should mention that if you're looking for the guideline online, you can go to the RNAO website and download an electronic copy of it for free. Um, if you'd like to purchase the guideline, you could click on purchase a hard copy link as well. And with this guideline, we have also published some supplementary information, including our guideline and systematic review search strategies and the expert panel and co-chairs declarations of conflicts of interest. In addition, uh, Michael Guerin Hospital was kind enough to allow us to post their har harassment and discrimination prevention policy as an example for anyone who's interested in viewing that. So the purpose of the Preventing Violence, Harassment and Bullying Against Health Workers, uh, BPG, is to enhance the safety of health service organizations and academic institutions by providing evidence-based recommendations to recognize, prevent and manage workplace violence, harassment and bullying. The recommendations in the guideline are directed to nurses and other health workers in direct care positions students, educators, administrators and executives, policymakers, and researchers. The guideline addresses violence, harassment, and bullying against health workers from formal leaders, colleagues, visitors, persons, and families, and is relevant for all health service organizations and academic institutions. And if you like more details on the purpose, scope, and intended audience, as well as to find out what was out of scope, you can turn to page six through eight in the guideline. The recommendations outlined in this guideline reflect the topic areas that the expert panel prioritized based on current need for guidance in clinical practice and in greater health organizations as a whole. The strategy is distinct from the first edition of the guideline in that it asks specific questions and identifies priority outcomes. And this is in an effort to provide specific and targeted recommendations. It also reflects a new and more rigorous standard of guideline development that RNAO has adopted to meet international standards, referred to as the GRADE and GRADE CIRCLE methodologies. For this guideline, three recommendation questions with accompanying outcomes were asked. The questions then guided are systematic reviews. So what you see on this slide is a Prisma flowchart that indicates the rigorous process for the systematic reviews that we conducted for the three research questions. 
Across the three questions, we had over 17,000 articles that we independently screened and appraised for their relevance and quality using validated tools. At the end, we had a total of 56 studies included across all three questions. As mentioned, RNAO is now following the grade and grade circle methodologies to develop the guidelines in order to align with international standards. GRADE stands for Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation, and GRADE CIRQUEL stands for Confidence in the Evidence of Reviews from Qualitative Research. The main difference between GRADE and GRADE CIRQUEL is that GRADE is used to appraise the quality of research evidence from quantitative studies, while GRADE CIRQUEL is used to appraise the quality of evidence from qualitative studies. So in the next few slides, I'll explain how to read the components of the guide of the recommendations within the BPG. And if you're familiar with the previous RNAO BPGs, you'll notice that the layout of the recommendations are slightly different in this one. So first you will see that the recommendation question on top that the expert panel prioritized. Following the recommendation question, you will see the priority outcomes chosen by the expert panel to address the recommendation question. Only those studies which address the prioritized outcomes were included in the discussion of evidence. Below that, you'll see the recommendation box, which outlines the recommendation statement. The strength of the recommendation, the certainty of the evidence of effects, and confidence in evidence. The strength of the recommendation is determined by the expert panel to be strong or conditional based on multiple factors. Certainty in evidence of effects refers to the quality of quantitative studies, whereas confidence in evidence refers to the quality of qualitative studies. So the recommendation box is followed by the discussion of evidence for each recommendation. The discussion of evidence, or DOE for short, includes six components, and I will explain each of these in a bit more detail. The first component is the benefits and harms. In simple terms, this section highlights the benefits of using the intervention on the prioritized outcome. This section also identifies if any harms were indicated in studies as a result of using the intervention. The second component is values and preferences, and it highlights the importance placed on the health outcome from following the recommended intervention from a person-centered perspective. Next, we have health equity, which highlights the impact of a specified intervention on health equity across populations. A study that indicates access to health services would be an example. The fourth component is the expert panel justification of recommendation. This provides a rationale for the expert panel's decision regarding the strength of the recommendation. Specifically, this section details why the panel decided to vote on the strength of the recommendation to be strong or conditional. Following the panel justification, you will see the fifth component called practice notes. This section includes practical information on how to implement the recommendation or conduct the intervention and adapt it to different settings. The final and sixth component of the DOE is the supporting resources. It includes relevant resources such as websites, links, and tools that support the recommendations and provide further context or information. So that includes the overview of how to read the recommendations in general. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Henrietta who will provide an overview of the recommendations. Thank you, Julia. So I'm gonna start with um, the recommendations that were made under question one. So just to remind you, question one, it was should healthcare workers be recommended to use risk assessment tools to detect behaviors indicative of workplace violence, harassment, and or bullying. And there are three recommendations underneath this first question. I'm gonna lump the first two together um, because they're quite interrelated here. And the first recommendation here is that there be an implementation plan for utilizing a workplace violence assessment tool. And the second is that violence uh, a violence risk assessment be completed on persons um, within the healthcare setting. So um, first and foremost, it was um, identified that the tool that's being used has to be applicable to the clinical population and the, the setting. And again, remember this is not the organizational risk assessment, this is a risk assessment of the person. 
So there are a number of resources you'll see at the end. Um, when we look at the actual implementation plan for uh, violence risk assessment, um, you can utilize a couple of PSHSA's toolkits um, to help you build that component of the program, and that's the individual client risk assessment and then the risk communication one or the, the flagging handbook. In the resource section here, you'll also see a listing of some validated tools. Um, so that's another critical component here is that where possible, the organization uses a validated tool. So many of the, to, the tools that have been currently validated to date are um, validated in the mental health setting. And the one that's currently under validation right now is the Violence Assessment Tool by PSHSA, and it's undergoing inter-rater reliability and predictability at this time. And the next key component um, is that the training on the tool um, includes how to score it and how to interpret the results, and then to make sure that the risk assessment is conducted to identify those risk behaviors. So it's really critical that the uh, purpose of the tool is clear to all the healthcare workers who are use, utilizing the tool. So we wanna be clear that it is meant to identify someone that it's higher, at higher risk. It is not meant to stigmatize a specific population. So that those are some of the components that an organization will want to take into account when they're looking at what tool to be used. One of the um, additional recommendations later on in the guideline, uh, 3.1, tells you what interventions might be needed when you um, have identified a risk, so you can refer to that if you're working on uh, this recommendation. Some of the practice notes that were provided by um, the evidence or by the expert panel were that there needs to be a communication strategy to relay the findings, that the information has to be clear and very easy to use for healthcare workers. So, those are a couple of additional components that would want to be. Uh, you would want to, to add in place for this element. The next question or the next uh, recommendation under question number one is that there be a validated in risk assessment to measure and develop quality improvement plans to address horizontal and vertical violence. And the strength of this recommendation was conditional. And that is because there, there was not a lot of evidence uh, for this particular recommendation that had been validated. So uh, again, this element or this recommendation is really looking at making sure we're protecting both the physical and the mental well-being of healthcare workers and healthcare students, and um, really focusing on that you know, it, it moves a little bit beyond identifying risk and having a plan to move forward. So this tool looks at horizontal violence from, uh, or recommends using a tool that looks at assessing horizontal violence from peers, vertical violence from leaders, and an assessment of incivility. And some of the practice notes that were identified um, inside the, the recommendation are that it should be um, used anonymously um, by, or, uh, or could be used anonymously by healthcare workers to comment on the culture of their organization. And there are several uh, tools and resources available that organizations in healthcare use related to culture and psychological health and safety that, that have components that may indicate there's concerns and may lead an organization to do a, a more detailed assessment. And the results are really meant to have that discussion and, and determine what the organization needs to put in place to address what may be um, identified as a, a concern related to bullying and harassment. And the other component with this uh, recommendation was that there, it was identified that more research is needed to validate tools that are used from a violence or from a harassment 
and bullying perspective. And then we move on to recommendation uh, 2.1. So, or rec um, and the recommendations in this section, and there's seven of them, relate specifically to question number two. So should organizational policies and procedures to prevent and manage workplace violence, harassment and or bullying among, among health workers be recommended to improve organizational and health worker outcomes? So again, uh, in when you think about the number of recommendations that are under this section, it points directly to the fact that workplace violence and harassment prevention is quite complex and requires uh, a multifaceted approach. We can't just um, implement one or two interventions and expect them to, to be effective. So this recommendation speaks directly to education and training for health workers on addressing violence and behaviors from persons. So a couple of the benefits of the training and education that have been identified by the literature is that we see a decrease in staff um, injuries and a reduction in the rate of assaults and threats, which is really what uh, outcomes we want to see. So one of the concerns raised um, within this recommendation are that we need to make sure when we educate healthcare workers that um, they don't feel they should be decreasing um, the reporting that they um, do related to workplace violence. So we know underreporting is still um, an, an issue in healthcare, and we need to make sure they are supported and I am um, identified in the training program that all types of violence should be re reported and that goes beyond those that cause a serious or more critical event because we wanna be looking at the near misses and the hazards so that we can implement measures to prevent uh, a recurrence. So some of the considerations in the practice notes um, are uh, about the type of training. So not the actual components of a training program, but the importance of using refreshers and drills and on the job training and that there be some sort of active learning component. So the um, return demonstration simulation case studies within the training program, and also that the training that's provided, the education and training is tailored to the scope of the practice. And when we think about what actual component should be in an education and training program for addressing violence, um, section or recommendations 3.1 to 3.3 talk a little bit uh, more about the training components. The recommendation 2.2 is about the protective um, and security measures that an organization um, may want to put in place. And again, in healthcare, there's great diversity in, in approaches. And when we think about um, some of the recommendations here, we also need to keep in mind the legislative components that are required for protecting healthcare workers, and that's in Ontario under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So you can see, if you're familiar with uh, Section 32 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, you, you can certainly see some correlation here. So um, it identifies that protective measures um, should include documentation and communication, and there's various forms of communication. There are a number of organizations who are using huddles, and there is a, um, a, a resource on the new uh, workplace-violence.ca website that talks about using huddles for workplace violence. There's communication at um, um, safety handoffs, and patient identification boards, whiteboards um, used within the individual units. There also needs to be equipment to protect um, workers about, uh, from violent behaviors and um, how and when healthcare workers have to and should use those pieces of equipment. So in some settings, Kevlar sleeves or, or protective gowns are used. Um, forearm pads, face shields, hair covers, you know, there can be a number of pieces of equipment. 
And the next one there is environmental security measures are required. And um, that could be in the form of panic buttons or personal safety alarms or um, patient alert systems. Some people call them PALs. Um, one of the caveats here, though, is to, to keep in mind that alarms alone are not protective, right? It's the response that happens when an alarm is activated where the protective measure comes into place. And last but not least, that formal reporting systems need to be in place that are easy to use. So whenever we can, we wanna simplify the reporting process and that can be electronic or paper-based um, uh, related to the patient alert or um, um, workplace injury reporting. So 2.3 is um, formal leaders should understand and implement policies against workplace violence and review and act on workplace violence incidents. So uh, again, I mentioned underreporting is still an issue uh, in the hospital setting. There was a Health Quality Ontario quip um, related to reporting of violent events. And in the first year, about two thirds of hospitals reported that they actually wanted to see an increase in um, violent events because they wanted to work on their reporting culture. So that's an, an important and strong message that workplaces in Ontario um, and Health Quality Ontario uh, was also supporting. So when we, we know that when formal leaders understand the policy and um, support having some sort of intervention and implementation, and that they're actually taking the time to review violent events, that we have better outcomes. So we have in decreased injury rates and we have staff feeling safer at work. Um, if there is no follow-up, uh, staff feel disappointed and they are reluctant to report. So we want to make sure that is critical. Um, health organizations also need to support training for uh, leaders to ensure they understand what education and training are, they require to um, review events and put appropriate controls in place. And there still is some fear of repercussions for reporting. So knowing what your culture is in your organization is important. And of course, following up on um, what steps have been taken to mit mitigate a harm is a requirement of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. So letting workers know what interventions have been put into place. And the next um, recommendation is 2.4. So that formal incident reviews are in place. And again, we know that um, there's decreased injury and better understanding of workplace violence overall if there's a good incident review done. And largely because if uh, an effective incident review is done, it involves frontline staff and then they are able to provide their expertise, but also to learn from the process. So at um, some organizations use huddles um, immediately after an event to review and reflect on the incident. Sometimes it has to wait depending on the severity of the event and it doesn't happen um, immediately. And it can be um, the form of a questionnaire following the event. And again, um, making sure that the process discusses the challenges um, and the successes, and it's always important to, to identify what went right and why an event perhaps didn't escalate to a serious event so we can learn from that as well. A practice notes, we need to make sure there's a policy to support formal incident reviews. We should always focus on promoting the recovery of healthcare workers after an event has occurred and um, making sure that we are using no blame uh, reporting and investigations, that this process is fact finding, not fault finding. Recommendation 2.5 um, suggests that education and training for healthcare workers and students on um, how to address uh, harassment and bullying 
uh, be implemented. So some of the benefits identified from uh, harassment and bullying training are that um, workers recognize the signs of harassment and bullying more um, frequently. They are able to learn um, how to communicate and that their education um, is not the only approach to har and harassment and bullying. So we can't rest on the fact that we've told um, frontline healthcare workers or students about the risk of workplace violence and that becomes the end. We also need to implement solutions. So Bill, what used to be Bill 168, which is now embedded in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, says that organizations have to follow a set process. Um, so they have to educate healthcare workers or all workers in Ontario on their policy on their, and on their program. They have to educate them on how to report workplace uh, harassment and bullying and what the follow-up is going to be. And then, of course, the continuous um, kind of ongoing discussion on at team meetings and huddles is an important way to identify if there are ongoing issues taking place. Recommendation 2.6 is that there are policies and codes of conduct to address harassment and bullying in the workplace. And again, we need to have policies in place for this. They need to be guided by what are leading practices. And there should be some sort of council or um, committee that looks at the strategies um, across the organization. So again, what was uh, Bill 168 or, or Section 32 of the Act has some guidance. It's always best practice to consult the healthcare worker when you're developing policies and codes of conduct. And that would be all stakeholders that are going to be impacted by the code of conduct. So they need the organization needs to look at their culture and make sure they have the resources and the policies in place that are actually going to make an impact on the healthcare workers and the students. And they, they um, again, have to participate in what's going on in their department and unit to really understand what the um, stressors are and what the potential sources of conflict can be um, in order to have those policies be effective. And recommendation 2.7 is uh, the last one in this section. And that's that formal leaders need to understand and enforce policies that address harassment and bullying, and then provide mentorship or um, role model what is um, acceptable or professional behavior. So some of the, um, the key components here is that the manager and the supervisors are really critical to show support, understanding, and endorsement for the policy, and that. Um, that mantra that everyone should be behaving with courtesy within the work environment. They need to make sure they are approachable and that they um, are purposeful in the actions that they provide for decreasing harassment and bullying. Um, making sure they're not overlooking unprofessional behavior, so what we walk by we condone, and that they demonstrate their commitment for addressing issues that they are aware of in, within their uh, span of control. Again, reporting should be encouraged, okay? so it can be supported if uh, leaders are willing to share stories about how they have managed conflicts, and again, um, the leaders themselves need to be provided with support skills and resources so they know how to resolve issues on violence and harassment. And then, then we move on to section three or um, question three. So there are three or five recommendations under question three. So that is, should education and training programs on preventing and managing workplace violence, harassment, and or be bullying be recommended for health workers to um, improve outcomes? So the first recommendation under this question is that education for health workers on the risk factors and triggers 
for violent behaviors from um, persons in the workplace. So again, um, when healthcare workers are provided with the knowledge and tools um, to prevent violence, we have um, improved outcomes. They need to have training on communication skills so they know how to diffuse a situation. So they really need to know about what the cues are that um, behaviors may be escalating. They need to know about strategies to de-escalate and to protect themselves. And they need to, um, to be able to do that with support from their, their managers and make sure it's done in a way that is not stigmatizing. So there is a, a really great supporting resource that is out now that came out from the leadership table. And again, it's on workplace-violence.ca. And it is about triggers and care planning. So um, identifying what the potential triggers may be are critical to uh, potentially mitigating an, an event from escalating. So knowing, you know, is it you know, do they escalate if they're hungry or they're thirsty or there's lots of noise, it's a busy atmosphere or when personal care is provided. And then again, what is the care planning piece that needs to be put in place? You know, are they calmer if you... Do we lose connection with Henry? There's a few comments in the chat box. Um, hold on, everybody. We're just going to um, try and touch base with Henry because it seems that her audio has been lost. Should I? Yeah, sure. So I'll take over for the remaining uh, four recommendations. So she did 3.1. So we'll move on to recommendation 3.2, which was training for health workers on de escalation techniques. Um, so de-escalation is a strategy to prevent and or reduce the escalation of aggressive and violent incidents and to decrease the need for mechanical and chemical restraints. Um, this edu education, um, the focus of this training tends to be education on effective communication strategies. And with this education, there's increased active listening and empathy skills among health workers and health workers' confidence and confidence improves. And a couple of points from the practice notes um, that were gathered from the expert panel and the stakeholders was that education should include both lecture and simulations and that health workers should receive ongoing refreshers, support, and reinforcement on the learning strategies. Recommendation 3.3 spoke to breakaway techniques. Oh, Henry, are you back? I'm back. Sorry oh, about that. No, I, don't, okay. I didn't know if you were disconnected or I was. I think you were. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, you could take over uh, recommendation 3.3. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so the 3.3 uh, is on training and breakaway techniques and when to safely use them. And uh, one of the caveats here is to remember that not providing appropriate training could actually lead um, to patient harm um, because a healthcare worker could be using a more restrictive practice than we would want to be in place. So it's very critical that they are provided with um, the appropriate training on breakaway techniques. And that's really the ability to remove themselves safely if they're in a hold or a grab or a pull um, without causing um, physical um, injury to the, the patient, okay? And it complements the other types of training. And healthcare workers report that they um, feel more confident that they're able to manage situations if the um, de-escalation 
um, strategies and communication strategies haven't worked. And again, um, we have to make sure that we focus on safety when um, healthcare workers are practicing the technique and that communication and de-escalation always comes first before we move into the breakaway techniques and um, retraining, refresher training, um, having the ability to practice this is critical so that we know the healthcare worker is protected, but also so that they're not causing harm to the patient. 3.4 is education to healthcare workers on how to identify harassment, bullying, and understand their impact. And again, about using effective communication strategies. And we know that there are benefits from it, that there are decreases in um, harassment and bullying and increases in awareness uh, that have been cited in the literature that again, uh, lectures are an important component, but there should be discussion and simulation when we're providing education. You know, when you think about being able to practice the ability to have a conversation would be very critical. It can be, there can be um, some sort of interactive role play utilized. And um, there, is, there was a caution in the literature that um, sometimes behaviors can be amplified when there has been an intervention within a workplace, but that assertive communication skills that are provided from a training component to healthcare workers have had an, um, a positive impact. There is a link to the SBAR tool that as a supporting resource and some of the practice notes that you'll see talk about encouraging you know effective dialogue and making sure again that frontline healthcare workers and employees are used utilized when you're developing the education program and the last recommendation is 3.5 that students should learn how to use guided communication responses to uh, address harassment and bullying and again the literature tells us that um, rehearsal training, cognitive rehearsal training and role play simulations um, allow um, students to practice effective solutions and have the strategies to move forward. That the most effective teaching methods are, are active and provide techniques to address workplace bullying. And the practice notes, uh, some of the um, literature and the expert panel um, suggested that we need to be cognizant and allow students to withdraw from a, an exercise if they become upset um, going through a role play. So you may have um, persons in the classroom who were victims of bullying or harassment in the past, and you need to be aware of that and watch for um, signs that someone may be upset. And then if that is the case, that there should be some debriefing held in a safe environment afterwards to let someone who, who was upset or even the entire classroom to reflect on their thoughts and feelings afterwards. And then back over to you, Julia. Great, thank you so much, Henry, for going through all those recommendations and the supporting resources and the practice notes and everything. Um, so when you're reading the guideline, after the recommendations section, um, we have appendices. And appendices include useful tools or guides that organizations, formal leaders, health providers and students can use when they're implementing the recommendations. Um, the source from which th these uh, appendices are adapted or modified are indicated at the bottom of each appendix. So for example, in this slide here is Appendix J, and it outlines a safe wards model that identifies six domains that may influence conflict in the workplace, followed by a table outlining 10 principal interventions to make the environment safer. Appendix F includes a list of risk factors identified within the systematic review that can predict violent or aggressive behaviors. And Appendix H provides a list of validated risk assessment tools identified within the literature, along with the setting and or population they can be used in. And a few other appendices also included in the guideline um, are found on this slide here with the accompanying page numbers. 
So also uh, provided within the guideline are evaluation measures that are specific to the recommendations. So if you're an organization implementing the BPG and want to know the impact of the recommendations on practice change or on patient outcome, you can use the measures outlined in these charts to monitor for success or areas that may require further change. The measures were developed with the panel and also received internal and external feedback, meaning that they have been validated. So if you turn to page 124 of the guideline, there's a detailed flowchart of the development of these measures as well. Uh, so we have process measures, structure measures, and outcome measures. So what can you do next and how can we help you? So what can you do beyond reading this guideline and how can the RNAO help you to use this guideline to its full potential? So at the RNAO, when we develop guidelines, our intention is to support the uptake of the guidelines into practice by supporting their dissemination and implementation. So we do this by hosting webinars, workshops, and other avenues to spread the knowledge. We also have evaluation metrics, as I just mentioned, so that organizations can know what impact the BPG is having on persons, providers, organizations, and systems. There are also a few resources that can help you implement this BPG in your practice, if you so wish. So we encourage you to read the guideline, which is available for free online or in hard copy if ordered. And I know today we did a very high level overview of the guideline, but we hope that you'll take some more time to read it thoroughly and perhaps discuss its implications with your colleagues. You can also conduct a gap analysis, which is an activity where you compare what best practice is saying about workplace violence prevention and how that may be similar or different to what is being done at your current practice. In instances where they do not align, perhaps this can help highlight practice areas for your organization that may be a priority. You can also become a best practice champion through our best practice champions network. RNAO has free e-learning courses, virtual learning series, and hosts in-person workshops that walk through processes and steps that it takes in order to take a BPG like this one and put it into practice. We also have a resource, the second edition of our implementation toolkit, which walks you through the systematic and planned steps of the knowledge to action framework. RNAO has also published many other guidelines on a variety of topics, and I just wanted to bring your attention to some specific BPGs that really go hand in hand with some of the key concepts outlined within the Preventing Violence um, BPG. Uh, so these are just five here, and these are also available for download for free. So if you have any questions about this guideline in the future, please feel free to contact us either by emailing our Guideline Development Project Coordinator, Verity, whose email you see on the screen, or through the RNAO website using the Contact Us link. If you have any specific questions regarding the guideline evaluation measures, you can also email the RNAO Evaluation and Monitoring Team and choir. And before we move ahead to answering any questions you might have, I just wanted to acknowledge that this guideline was funded by the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. So again, if you have any questions, please use the chat box to ask them and ensure that when you write something in the chat box, you use the all participant option. So there's one question in the chat box already. Um, and it says, when one has followed all the correct processes, processes but nothing gets accomplished or changed, um, what would you recommend a person do? The ideal and the reality are often two different situations. Hi, it's Althea. I think that when you have gone through uh, the process and there is still a problem, that's an indication that maybe some upfront indicators or assessment when you did your gap analysis might have been missed. So it's important that you take time to go back and do an additional gap analysis and really try and identify uh, what the problem is using all of the data that you do have, looking at the indicators and trying to do a determination of what 
ca cause the incident to happen and where the gaps arose in there. Oftentimes it might be uh, education, it might be time of day. There are a number of different factors that will influence um, the, the violent act. But recognizing if when you do your, your analysis, because after each unfortunate uh, violent incident, you should of course come together to do that analysis and explore what caused the incident and who was involved in the incident and do some of those interviews to understand. So you do have to take a step back. With guideline implementation, as Julia mentioned, the knowledge to action framework within the uh, toolkit that is recommended for implementation uh, of, of the guidelines and any specific recommendations will walk you through step by step but you will also see within that toolkit that the arrow goes both ways. So that if for whatever reason you're not successful, then you need to go back to the beginning and do a, a, a secondary assessment. And that means uh, the gap analysis. So I hope that that uh, answers your question. If it does not, uh, please let us know. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, so we'll end the webinar there. Um, if, like we mentioned before, anybody has any additional questions or thinks of something after the webinar has ended, please feel free to email us. Either uh, you could email Verity um, or use the contact us link um, at www.rnao.ca. Otherwise, thank you very much for participating um, and we thank you again.